Hello, this is James Arnold. In this session, we're going to talk about mechanics changes. We're going to talk about suggested COVID-19 procedures. And we're going to talk about the mechanics manual a little bit. And we're going to talk about the playoffs. First of all, let's talk about mechanics changes for 2020. Basically, we're ba it's not really a change. It's, this is kind of what we've been teaching in the camps last year, I know, and some of the year before that. Uh, basically, we're going from our initial keys, the numbering system, where we're numbering our the receiving team, one, two, three, four here, one, two, three, four here, and five. We're going to zone coverage. So after the ball is kicked, we immediately go into zone coverage. The mechanics are the same. The referees at the goal line with the wing officials, the field judge and side judge of the six-man crew are still at R's restraining line, and the umpire is at K's restraining line. So as soon as the ball is kicked, umpires busting it to the middle of the field to get in their zone, zone coverage, initial keys the same, stay making sure that the kicker's out of danger, nobody's cheap shot in the kicker, and again goes to zone coverage working inside out. Everybody else is off the field except for the referee. And basically at that point, it's a running play all the way down the field. So let's say the ball is kicked here. Close to the goal line, referee and head linesman in this situation will look at each other and make sure that he's not in. It's not a touchback. Uh, if you see the touchback, proper touchback signal is right here. It's over your head, side to side. That's the proper touchback signal uh, if, it, if it's in the goal line. And like we've said in the past, if it's half yard line, his momentum takes him back in, nobody's going to say anything if it's a touchback. You know, if it's a touchback, it's a touchback. So no, somebody's going to say something if he's in the end zone, he catches the ball, he runs it out. So just FYI. So in this situation, the ball is caught. We're winding the ball. Headlinesman and uh, line judge, head line judge are basically, they've got the ball carrier all the way down the field to the two-yard line. Referee immediately after the catch is good, he, he immediately goes to zone coverage, looking at the blocks in front of the runner. Field judge, side judge, coming five to 10 yards downfield, depending on how deep the ball is kicked. Zone coverage in front of the runner if it comes to their side. Off ball coverage if it's to the other side. Uh, one thing that we did see last year uh, I want to hit on is in a, any kind of free kick in high school football now, if it's a varsity game and mostly in JV games, you sh the only people who should ever come on the field should be the umpire and the referee. Those are the only two people we saw. And I think it was a championship game last year. We had a kickoff to this side. Headlines was going downfield. The line judge actually came downfield and was running almost at the numbers. We do not want that, guys. We are in gals. We want this off the field, running down the sideline, off the field. So remember that. That's just a, a FYI. Also, umpires we've seen. Several umpires, especially during the regular season on six-man crews, the umpire basically jogging in here or strolling in here at some, or walking in here. The umpire, after the ball's kicked and we got to get a kick, it's, nobody's off sides or it's not a dead ball situation, he's busting it in here. He's running as hard as he can to get in here. And then he sets up and has his zone coverage. He doesn't have to go downfield that far, but he has to bust it to get in there for his – to make sure the kicker's – is clear and then zone coverage working inside out everything else is defined in the mechanics manual uh, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this but six man mechanics it's it's basically the same just clarified a little bit seven man also the same the only difference here is our back judge here we're splitting the field into three into four zones here instead of three better coverage shouldn't ever miss anything right guys and gals Mechanics manual, let's talk about that. In the past with our, the fee uh, for the officials camp has covered the cost of referee magazine basically uh, putting our manual on their digital porter and us paying the licensing fees for all their uh, mechanics grams and everything else uh, that they own and license uh, in their books. So this is basically, a referee magazine book that you would purchase that they put together for us. Um, and we've paid part of your camp fee in the past has paid for this, for you to get this for free as part of you 
attending a camp. Well, this year, reducing the camp to $30, there's no money there after the Georgia High School fee and paying everybody who puts all this stuff together for you. Uh, there's no money there to pay for these uh, manuals. So this year, you will have to purchase your manuals. It's one manual on their digital portal like it has been. Go to it. We, we sent out the link just recently so you can go online and purchase it. It's $10.95. That cost is completely to Referee Magazine. Uh, no, no money comes back to Georgia High School. No money comes back to the camp committee. All that is what they charge. Uh, we, are, we do have to pay them a fee every year to edit this and update this thing. So we, you know, part of your camp fee this year out of the $30 that you're paying is going back to Referee Magazine to pay their fee to update the manual and uh, part of the fee to host it. So part of your fee actually is going to this, but we don't have enough to pay the whole fee that they charge. Usually they charge a high school association or a college association if they have their own mechanics manual through them, like $20. And they gave us a great deal at $10.95. Uh, I hope you take advantage of this manual. It is first class. Uh, their mechanics grams are real clear to read. Uh, the changes are, are highlighted here. Uh, all their mechanics, uh, everything that, uh, that is for Georgia is in here. Basically our seven man manual is mostly NCA uh, there's seven man mechanics. There's a licensing fee that referee magazines pay, pays the ref, the NCA. So we in turn pay referee magazine who pays the licensing fee to NCA. So our, for our seven man manual. So it is different, but a lot of the mechanics are the same and the mechanic grams are the same that they use in here. So if you're wondering why you're having to pay $10 and 95 cents for your manual this year, this is why, uh, it's a first class manual. Uh, we, we think that you, instead of us putting together and having little dots and all this other stuff that doesn't look very professional and not well done this this platform you know is just another of you know why georgia high school officials are better in my opinion than most other states why our football i mean our football is top notch top one or two in the country and we have to be top notch one or two high school officials in the country to keep up with this and this is one of the things that should help you as along with the, all the other stuff that we have for you, you know, free training at the referee, uh, GHSA referee training website that we have with all our different stuff from our camps for the last few years. We, we hope you take advantage of that also. So uh, you got a lot of tools to you. This one may cost you a little money this year, but we feel it's well worth it. Now let's talk about a little bit about the the virus and some of the stuff that's been put together by National Federation and uh, Georgia High School for your, if you wanna do it, you can do it. It's, it's just guidelines, they're not mandates. There's no mandates in there that you have to do any of this. We are asking, except for the, basically the social distancing whenever possible, everything else is a suggestion. So let's go through a few of these recommendations from the Georgia, from Georgia High School and the National Federation. First of all, we'll talk about the uniform. In the past, we've never wanted anybody, if everybody's got short sleeve shirt on, everybody wears a short sleeve shirt. If everybody wears a long sleeve shirt, everybody wears a long sleeve shirt. And we never have a long sleeve black fitted shirt up under a short sleeve shirt. Well, this year with the virus situation and for anything that we're, we're looking for, anything that will help you feel more comfortable and safe out there as you re officiate this year, it is permissible if you want to wear your long sleeve shirt. And then we have, if people want to wear a short sleeve shirt, and there's a couple of people who don't feel comfortable wearing a short sleeve shirt out there, they want to wear a long sleeve, they feel more comfortable, and it gives them more protection, that's fine. No problem. Also, if somebody wants to wear a black, um, compression long sleeve shirt up under their short sleeve shirt that's also permissible we're not gonna anything to make you feel more comfortable as as in you can see right here if you went with that the only thing we ask is it's black not white not blue or gray or any other color if you're gonna wear a long sleeve compression shirt up under your short sleeve shirt just try to keep it black <clears throat> also mask masks are not mandated in any sense 
at this point. Now, if the governor mandates the wearing of masks, and then we may have to adjust that, and that guidance will come from Kevin and, and Georgia High School Association. But at this point, as of this uh, recording, there is no mandate that you wear a mask as you officiate. So if you do wear, uh, we, if you do want to wear a mask, you feel, you know and feel more comfortable. That is fine. Or a gator, one of these right here. The only thing that we ask is they either be black or white. If you want to wear this striped thing too, that's fine. We just don't want any kind of communication or advertisement or anything like that on it. Just keep it simple. You know, don't draw attention to yourself. You know, who who would have ever thought a few years ago that wearing a mask would not draw attention to yourself, but this is the way of the world we have right now. So permissible, yeah, you know, just keep it simple. Make sure that you feel comfortable. It's whatever you want to do. Also, if you want to use a electronic whistle, if you're wearing a mask, you can't blow a whistle. So if you use an electronic whistle, there's several out there that you can purchase. Please use those if you'd like. Also gloves, if you want to wear gloves, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with. If you want to wear short sleeve shirt, black compression shirt up under there and wear gloves, go right ahead and do it. Uh, the one thing that we do ask is that they're football gloves like you'd wear in cold weather, you know, black, mostly black or white, whatever. Keep it simple. We really don't want pink gloves out there, or yellow gloves. Another thing you need to be aware of is officials are not responsible for monitoring activities on the sideline, such as social distancing, hand washing, symptoms of illness or other such issues. This monitoring of anybody on the sidelines remains with the coaching staff and the school personnel and the game administration. So we have no, we have no business worrying about what they're doing or how they're doing it or whatever over there. That's up to the coaching staff and game administration. All right, let's, let's talk about your arrival at the school, uh, what the schools are responsible for, and procedures for pregame. First of all, if, you want to arrive, if your game kicks off at 7.30 and your plan is to dress at the school, say like right in here, uh, if you want to dress it, I mean, I'm sorry, if you want to come dressed to the school, uh, put everything, everybody meet in the parking lot as right here and, you know, you know, put your hat on and get your whatever else you need to officiate the game in the parking lot, come dressed. Feel free to do that. If you don't want to get there till if your game kicks off at 730 and you want to get there at 630, everybody meet in the parking lot. Uh, make sure that's fine. Come dressed if you want to make sure that your game administrator for that game knows what time you're going to get there, knows how many parking places you need. Let the let them know that um, that you're going to come dressed uh, and have make sure that their security person or game administration person meets the crew in the parking lot wherever they're going to park you. Uh, that's key. They they are responsible for your security as you get to as you arrive at the game site. And if you're going to come dressed, they need to meet you in the parking lot. Uh, all that every week needs to be told to the game administrator. What time you're going to get there? I would suggest no later than an hour before game time. Uh, if you want to, if you think you can cut it close at 45 minutes and get everything in, get everybody in a position to start the clock at 30 minutes, that would be tough. I would say an hour would probably be cutting as close as you want to get to, and that's fine. Uh, this year with all the COVID stuff, we want to make sure that. Uh, everybody's comfortable in, in what they're doing. So after you get there, the arrival at the school, hopefully the game administration will have somebody there to take your temperature uh, and make sure everybody's feeling well. If, if somebody arrives at the game site and doesn't feel well, tired or hurting or don't feel well and got a temperature, they cannot officiate that night. They need, really, they need to go home. And in that situation, if you don't have somebody who's on the clock who can come down on the field, then you're going to have to work five-man crews. And my suggestion, and I'm, I'm putting it out there, is make sure that during your week of pregame, and in these situations where you're, if you're coming dressed and you're going to do your pregame, you need to do your pregame beforehand. I suggest Thursday night. 
or you can talk, do a conference call as you drive to the game site. You know, I don't know if you're going to ride together. A lot of you are going to ride separately. All that has to be worked out beforehand. You know, and also, like I said before, let the game administrator know how many parking places that you're going to need. If there's seven cars coming, they need to find seven parking places for you to park or eight, whatever it is. So all that has to be done beforehand. I, I don't know. Every association handles this differently. The referees may be responsible for doing that or the assigner for each game may be able to be responsible for that. But all that needs to be spelled out to every game administrator before every game on Friday night or Saturday or whenever it's going to be. So when you get, arrive back, let's go back. So if you arrive at the game side and you do not feel well, be prepared as a crew to cover five-man mechanics and have, be, have, have that in the back of your head. The five-man mechanics manual is still online. You can download it for free at the Georgia High School football training website. It's been there. We haven't updated it in several years because the mechanics haven't changed in several years. But you need to have that in your back pocket. Download it on your phone or tablet or Print it out, whatever you want to do. So that's out there for you. If you come into an emergency situation where nobody else is available and the last second somebody's ill and they can't officiate that night, you're going to have to go to five. So be prepared for that. Now, the schools are, as part of the mandate from Georgia High School, that they provide the officials with a disinfected clean area for their pregame com for your pregame conference that has been sterilized that has been clean and they're supposed to have sanitizing stuff available to you some kind of sanitizer hand wash or whatever it is may be that's what they're responsible for and a pregame place where you can be socially distanced to have your pregame i've talked to a lot of people who are just gonna who would feel more comfortable just arriving dressed, having done their pregame in advance, and then go on the field. But if you want to do this at, at a school uh, right here, socially distanced pregame, this should be available to, to you. If it is not, you need to make sure that you let your signer know so he can report it to Georgia High School Association. And just like in this picture right here, we're going to try to stay socially distanced as a crew when we come on the field. That means we're going to have to get in a corner somewhere in a circle, socially distance, to talk about stuff before going to the field also. It's a different world out there, guys. So, you know, take advantage of everything that you have, all your tools that you have available to you, and what the, the schools are supposed to provide us. You know, and if you feel comfortable doing a socially distanced pregame at the game site, you should have that available to you. That's cruel. If you if you want to come dress to the game, get there an hour before the game, meet in a parking lot and go on the field, that's cool also. Uh, I've had a few questions. Is, it, is every place going to check your temperature before, pre -get, before you go on the field or enter the stadium? I believe that is part of the Georgia High School mandate that every game person – personnel will have their temperature taken before they enter the field or before they enter the game. So that's players, coaches, and everybody, all game administration. All right, let's talk about coin toss. As you can see in this mechanogram here from your mechanics manual, uh, we're probably going to do a little different pregame this uh, coin toss this year, where in the fact that we're only going to have one captain from each team come on the field. Uh, the National Federation recommends that you only have one official out there for the coin toss. I, I really don't feel comfortable in that. Your coin toss should be covered with two officials, your referee and your umpire here. Uh, you can be socially distanced as you come on the field and stay socially distanced during the coin toss. Uh, one captain will be walked out by, you know, whoever's responsible for walking out the captains one captain from each team the, the official on the sideline will not walk the captain out he will the referee will wave the captains out they'll walk out by themselves everybody stay socially distanced referee i suggest you have a big enough coin to where everybody can see what's heads or tails from a social distance just a little tidbit there um have the get your 
whatever the guy wants, heads or tails, flip the coin, catch it, don't catch it, up to you. Make sure that after you toss the coin, you show each team what the result was, do your basic coin toss mechanics, give the signal, stay socially distanced. Pretty simple, different world, yes, I understand that, but this is what we have to do. Pre-game and post-game ceremonies uh, basically suspended because of the COVID-19. With have suspended basically all handshaking, uh, pre-game and post-game. So let's talk a little bit about your pre-game with your head coach. The National Federation recommends that you have one official and one head coach in the middle of the field. I don't know how well that would work. Honestly, I think <clears throat> you need two officials there talking to the head coach. So, you know, we've all officiated, if you've officiated for a, a long period of time, you know the reason why you need two officials when you're talking to the head coach pregame. Things get forgotten, blah, blah, blah. You can stay socially distanced with two officials and one head coach. Middle of the field, I, you know, I'm not going to tell you to go to the middle of the field. I would just find a corner somewhere, somewhere away from everybody else where you can talk to the head coach. Keep it simple, keep it quick. Basically, you're, you're asking the same questions you have asked in the past. You know, get the captain's number. Get, we're only going to do one captain. Well, you want an offensive and defensive captain. You can get all the captain's numbers and then get the captain who you're going to walk out there. Uh, I always ask who, the, who your starting quarterback is, what his number is, if he's right-handed or left-handed. I always ask about the field goal kicker, right footed or left footed, his number, and the punter's number, and the, if he's right footed or left footed. Remind him of sportsmanship. And then we're going to have to ask this one additional question that's been added this year. This question has been added by Dr. Hines. This question will be asked before every pregame to every head coach of every sport that Georgia High School has this year. So you're going to ask this for every pre, every varsity game every playoff game and every jv game and the question is prior to the each contest all players you will, you will ask the head coach prior to each contest that all players have been screened as defined by their infect, infectious disease protocols plan and are not positive for covid 19 to the best of their knowledge at that point they should say yes Again, Georgia High School will require all Georgia High School officials to ask the head coach prior to each contest if all players have been screened as defined in their infectious disease plan and are not positive for COVID-19 to the best of their knowledge. Why that you have to ask that? That's a legal question. I'm not a lawyer, but this is a mandate that you have to ask when you're having your pregame with the head coach. A couple other things to talk about in our COVID considerations this year. Um, the National Federation Georgia High School on each team box has been moved out to the 10 yard line on each 10 yard line. Um, so they can take their players out to the 10 yard line to socially distance their teams. A recommendation from me is do not hesitate if that coach is down at the 10 yard line raising cane at you for whatever reason, if he's using that team box expansion just to stand there and complain to you or grab at you, feel free to send them back to the 25. Don't hesitate to send them back to the 25 <clears throat> because that 10 yard box has not been moved out for their, so they can continue to, uh, complain or gripe at the officials. That's for their team to move out and their team to be socially distanced. That's what the reason that's for. And uh, so they're, they're, all their team personnel can observe social distance three to six feet, which in some situations will be really tough. Let's talk about some more protocols. If you do not feel well, please notify, you know, in advance, if you don't feel well, 
do not hesitate to cancel the cancel out on the game. Uh, notify your assigner immediately. NASA Federation in this presentation recommends calling the school and whatever. But your responsibility is to your assigner. Uh, your assigner will take it from there. Uh, I don't see everybody needs to call the administrator if they're not feeling well. Uh, this says the temperature above 100.3. If you're not, I'm just going to say, if you're not feeling well, do not hesitate to say, I do not need to officiate tonight. Just a reminder, vulnerable individuals as defined by the CDC as people 65 or older and others with serious underlying health conditions. Uh, officials fitting this description may wish to seek medical advice prior to returning to officiating in, in 2020. A few more protocols to talk about. Travel considerations we talked about beforehand. If you don't feel comfortable traveling together, please travel separately. Uh, do not share uniforms, towels, apparel, or equipment, especially water bottles. Uh, I would bring your own water bottle. Uh, put together something somewhere to keep it on the sideline for the officials work out something uh, it, It's I know it's different. It's going to be hard. Some associations are buying water bottles for their officials <clears throat> There's a lot of things that can be done um, I would highly suggest bringing your own water and then working out some way to get it to you on the field or whatever <clears throat> Again maintain socially distance distancing is three to six feet while in the locker room or on the field Georgia High School has uh, added to their constitution and bylaws. All members of schools hosting a regular season and playoff contest shall sanitize the officials' dressing room prior to their arrival and providing sanitizing equipment in the dressing area for individuals needed needs for the contest officials and have ample space and social distance. That's for your pregame. Again, this is what's supposed to happen. If it does not happen, make sure that you notify that you're a signer and they can contact Georgia High School and appropriate action can be done. All right, let's talk about playoff process. It really has not changed from last year. Uh, we're just gonna hit, we're gonna hit the highlights through this. Eligibility is the same as it was last year. Must attend a G GHSA playoff camp, work enough games to have a credit for a good year, which is five. Uh, varsity games are a combination of varsity plus JV games. A JV game counts as a half, so whatever combination, at least get five varsity games in. Must complete the Georgia High School Clinic online. Must take the rules test online and pass with the 84 better. Must take the online seven-person mechanics clinic in November. All those have to be done for you to be playoff eligible in 2020. Now, this could change. Let's say the season got reduced or whatever. We will adjust as needed. All right, let's talk about playoffs and rounds three, four, and five. So, as in the past, your, uh, your association uh, will be assigned games in rounds one and two, just like they have been in the past. If you want, uh, if you want to put together a crew or crews, for rounds three, four, and five, you can do that, and you can submit those to be eligible for playoffs in rounds three, four, and five. How is that going to work? Is this like it was last year? So the, basically the associations are split up into thirds depending on how many playoff-eligible officials you have in your association. So the top third will get to, get to submit three Crews for playoffs to work in rounds three, four, and five. The middle third will get to submit two, and the bottom third will get to submit one. No change from last year. These crews that are submitted for works rounds, rounds three, four, and five will be evaluated by the Playoff Evaluation Board, which is we call PEB. The Playoff Evaluation Board is made up of these gentlemen right here. Uh, it's a people from across the state every every part of the state is a part of this playoff evaluation board in 2020 uh, just a little feedback there the the playoff evaluation board will uh, will not just they will work they will not see the same crews over and over again so if they work 
if they evaluate one crew the first two weeks of the two weeks, then they won't see that crew again probably till later in the playoffs. So, how's the evaluation going to start? The first two week, the last two weeks of the regular season, the crews, the association crews that have been submitted for the to work rounds three, four, and five will work together the last two weeks of the pl- the regular season. They will be evaluated those that week, those two weeks, to get a baseline uh, average uh, score for their crew. Then they'll work together the first two weeks of the playoffs. They'll be evaluated during those first two weeks, and they'll be ranked. And then the top crews will work rounds three. So that's 32 games in round three. So the top 32 crews will work there. Then the top, they'll be evaluated that week. The top 16 crews will work round four. And then the top eight crews will work the finals, just like it was last year. District crews. How do district crews work? Same as it did last year. Each association can submit one official per position to their to be submitted as a district crew. There's six district crews that are put together across the state. And this is basically people who are not working in the crews. They're submitted for their association crews. This gives extra availability for, say, people who did not make the cut for the uh, association crews or maybe smaller associations that didn't get to submit but one crew and they've got three or four other officials that they believe can go deep in the playoffs, those people can be submitted to possibly get to work as part of an association, uh, district crew, I'm sorry, and it'll be basically a mix and match uh, crew of different officials from different associations who will also be ranked and evaluated the last two weeks of the regular season, the first two rounds of the playoffs, and they will be lumped in with the association crews and their scores so basically the top 32 crews, rounds three out of the district crews and the association crews will work rounds three. And then all those crews that made that cut will be evaluated that week and round, and then those top crews will work round f- the fourth round and then the top crews will work the finals. So this is basically uh, another opportunity for officials, maybe in uh, different associations who didn't get selected for association crews to possibly get to work the finals. So let's talk about dates for submission of association crews and district crews. We had some dates already put out uh, to the to the leadership of each association, but those dates are basically going to be moved. At this time, we're not sure which dates we're going to move those, what time uh, that you have to submit your crews or your association crews or your district crews. Uh, due to the season getting pushed back a couple of weeks. So that information will come out to your association leadership. If you do not hear that information or it's not posted in your association leadership, please you know, email me or email uh, Kevin uh, and find that information out. It'll be posted, it'll be either posted on the Georgia High School website and it'll be submitted to your association leadership. If any of this stuff that you've never heard of, of how we're doing playoffs or how we're doing district crews or how what the information on the mechanics manual or whatever, if this is not this is the first time you're hearing any of this and your association has not let you know, we need to know that so we can get the information to you. It, none of this stuff is a secret. We put everything out every year. All this stuff is available to you every year. And the you as an official, you, your responsibility is to find this stuff out. If you don't find it out, from your association, you need to find out from somebody, and you know that's what the leadership of the training committee, or the one of the uh, football liaisons between me, Keith, and, and Rick, are are key to give you that information. All that information is out there for you. If you're not getting it from your local leadership, then please let us know, and we'll get that information to you. Lastly, I want to talk about flag football. Flag football is a new sport this year. At Georgia High School, it's a sport for females. Um, this year, uh, we will, I think we have 97 teams uh, at, as of this date that are going to play flag football. 
Um, if you've ever officiated flag football in college or maybe uh, if you're in the military, referee flag football or whatever league, flag football league, or they have some on Saturday, Sunday for adults. You, this is going to be good for you. you know, this is another opportunity to officiate football. Basically how it works is every team that has a uh, flag football team, um, if your association works that team in regular football, then you will be assigned, your association will be assigned that team for flag football to cover. Uh, so we're looking for, you know, every association uh, person uh, has the opportunity to call flag football. This year, because of the COVID, we've had a lot of teams drop out. So there's not a lot of teams, let's say South of Macon. There's, a, there's some in Savannah. There's a lot in West Georgia, Columbus area, uh, LaGrange area, a lot in Metro Atlanta, uh, East Georgia, Augusta, some in that area for South County, uh, Cobb County, all Metro Atlanta, uh, that flag football is going to be played this year. It's a quick game. I mean, the games last an hour at the most. Uh, the games will be played at least as a doubleheader or possibly three games so one crew can go work two or three games at every game site this year uh, the games will be played under the nursery uh, flag football rules uh, it, with the exception there are there are georgia high school exceptions and those are listed on the georgia high school website also training material is uh, at the ghsa football training website we have a flag football link there has a bunch of videos through NURSA and a link to the uh, Georgia High School exception. So if you're interested in doing flag football, all of that training material is out there for you. Well, we had a meeting the other day. <clears throat> As part of your uh, registration, there is a separate registration for flag football. If you're a regular football official, I think you only have to play twelve fifteen dollars for your registration to to, re to officiate flag football and we're working on trying to get you a rule book for as part of your administ as part of your registration that'll be a nurser rule book so remember your nurser rule book is going to cover flag all the flag football rules except for the georgia high school exceptions which are listed on the georgia high school website i don't want to go through those tonight or today uh, I'll, I'll be a coordinator for flag football just like for regular football, uh, our liaisons, Jay Worley, Todd Downs, and David Reynolds. So you will have <clears throat> a clinic you'll take online. You'll have a test you'll have to take online. Uh, and then training materials are out there uh, that we have listed at the GHSA football training, uh, a football official training website that we have out there. So we look forward to hopefully that you'll be uh, – You'll be eligible. You'll, you'll want to work these games. The They're going to have playoffs just like regular football. This is going to start in October, run through November. We're going to start playoffs. The semifinals will be held at the um, Mercedes-Benz Dome outside in their Home Depot backyard. If you're, ever, if you're familiar with the uh, new Mercedes-Benz Stadium, they have a Home Depot backyard, grass field in the back. We're going to – the Falcons are going to host uh, that for us outside in December. And then the championship games will be held at the um, before the single, a, the single A championship on that Monday in December. So they'll be held at the Georgia State Stadium, uh, the same place that the regular football is going to be played, championships are going to be played at. They'll be played on that Thursday. So two re there's two different divisions of flag football this year. So the two division champions will play. Well, I mean, the two divisions will play for championships on that th on that Monday, then a Class A game, and then the championship finals will last Friday and Saturday. So we're we're hoping that you're everybody's interested in calling flag football this year. Uh, we think it'll be a lot of fun. It's a growing sport. Lastly, I want to thank everybody out there for officiating this year. Uh, with all the stuff that's going on in the world, with everything, with the, the virus out there, and uh, for you to take, you know, with everything going on and officiating flag football, uh, I'm sorry, and regular, fo regular football and flag football, hopefully, 
Um, it's much appreciated by Georgia High School, myself, Kevin, Dr. Hines, Ernie, uh, Rick Bodie, uh, Keith Hammond. We all appreciate everything that you all you are doing. It's you know, I I, I can't say how much everybody appreciates what you're doing because we're going to have football this year in some way or form we're going to play football so everything that you're doing out there is just making that possible for all the kids and coaches who want to play football and it is very much appreciated i hope you enjoy the rest of your sessions the rest of this online online education that we're offering this year and i hope to see you soon thank you welcome to new rules review 2020 this year has been the fewest in recent memory, but two of the rules changes make changes or clarify changes as recent as 2019. So let's get started. Within the pregame conference, among several head coach declarations, he is to designate a game long individual that will make all decisions concerning penalty acceptance, decline, or options when there are multiple. Injury, ejection, or an emergency can change this designation, but otherwise this assignment lasts the entire game. It is reasonable to assume it will be the head coach, as it most often has been in the past, but this formalizes the assignment. There are several other declarations. Remember, he has to say that his team is legally equipped. This just adds to the pregame conference, which this year, with all the COVID-19 restrictions, is certainly going to be altered, perhaps shortened. This rule change has the potential to be helpful in the early months in our state. Lots of thunderstorms, lightning. I'm aware that the GHSA bylaws contain a mandatory 20 minute halftime unless prior written agreement during the week prior to the game. This National Federation rule overrides the bylaw when its very limited criteria are applicable. Notice that this has a application just in the last three minutes of the second period. This rule has the potential to reduce travel time, exposure to weather, and may even allow a game to be completed when it might otherwise not have finished. Please note that at least a one minute halftime must be held, and regardless of the length of the halftime, their mandatory three minute warm up is not waived. This one has the potential to create problems for clock operators, field judges who are timing on the field, and referees if it's not remembered. Defensive injury or equipment issues are a 40 second play clock. Similar problems for an offensive team member result in a 25 second play clock. The rules committee was concerned about defensive teams gaining an advantage late in games. Let's look at some scenarios where the multiple with multiple clock stopping events occur. Earlier this year, I sought clarification from the National Federation on what type of play clock we would have with dual injuries, an injury plus a penalty, and an injury followed by a prolonged media timeout. I even inquired what to do about inadvertent whistles and an injury. Okay, in this case play, a defender is injured after a blindside block. We have a flag. The clock stops for the penalty or the injury. With this scenario, the National Federation desires the play clock to be 25 seconds. The game clock will be started depending upon action on the play in question. But if you have a penalty, 
that you're going to enforce and you have a injury to the defense, we still revert to a 25 second play clock. Talk about an inadvertent whistle with a defensive injury. Remember that if you replay after an inadvertent whistle, you have a 25 second interval. So the first scenario, the offense selects to play the next down from a dead ball spot of the inadvertent whistle. That play clock is 25 seconds, even if you've had a defensive injury. The second scenario, the offense elects to replay the down. The play clock is still a 25 second play clock, despite defensive injury in both situations. How about an injury plus a prolonged media timeout? This you may see, for instance, in our finals at Georgia State. You have an injury to a defender with a prolonged media timeout. It reverts to a 25 second clock. A good rule of thumb. The only time a 40 second clock comes into play with a defensive injury, if that is the only reason to stop the clock. Anything else combined reverts to 25 seconds. Now, this was an omission from last year's rule book, and it's just simply a clarification. After a legal kick, and either team, either team is awarded a new series, there's a 25 second play clock. This was an omission from the rule book last year, and many states just handled it on their own, as did Georgia. Disconcerting act penalty reclassified. This is going to be interesting because someone has to interpret what a disconcerting act is. It can certainly be physical movement, and it can be words by the defense. In this problem, when it's been enforced in prior years, it's been a 15 yard unsportsmanlike foul. That has changed. It is now a five yard penalty. It's not unsportsmanlike. And the signal is the old failure to wear required equipment signal that got tossed when the rule changed, right hand flat behind the head. Importantly, this is not treated as an unsportsmanlike foul. This one's been a long time coming, guys, but it has some nuances to it that are important. Spiking the ball to stop the clock from the spread or the shotgun formation. There are several requirements for this to occur that must be met. The player that spikes the ball must be positioned directly behind the snapper. The snap cannot be muffed or touch the ground, and a muff can simply be bobbling it in the hands. The action must be immediate without delay. No faking downfield, no taking two steps to the right and then deciding to spike the ball. It must be immediate action after receiving the snap. This may not seem like a new rule change to some of you. It's an attempt to clarify and standardize what states should be doing and they have been doing it differently around the country. In Georgia, I think we have enforced this differently in various parts of the state. Now, this rule says an ineligible cannot go past the expanded neutral zone before the forward pass is in flight. Some states allowed a blocker keeping contact with a defender and driving him past the expanded zone. They allowed that to be legal. This is now forbidden. Equally important, if you wander past the expanded zone, realizing where you are and returning back behind the line of scrimmage or to the expanded neutral zone is illegal. 
hopefully this will standardize how we officiate the run and shoot type offense in particular around the state. Please keep this in mind, line judges who are primarily responsible and umpires secondarily responsible for this. Now you're going to have a short quiz. You'll be directed to a Google document to record that. I'm glad that you've listened to this. The rule changes are clear, concise, and short. Thank you for your time. The GAOA needs you now more than ever. My name is Hayes Cook, president of the Georgia Athletic Officials Association. Our mission is simple, is promote excellence, advocate for you, and amplify your voice. You can join by two memberships, our traditional membership or our new free membership. Go to our website today, gaathleticofficials.org, or click the link to find out more information. Thank you.